BioBalance HealthCast, episode 255, Five Strategies for Surviving the Emergency Room. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counsel. All of these podcasts that we do are, are meant to be standalone, but sometimes they're thematic, and, and over a period of several podcasts, we develop or try to develop a theme. In our previous uh, podcast, we were talking about the concept of the emergency room versus the urgent care versus the public clinic at a, at a corporate place and a like office. Walgreens and a doctor's office and mm-hmm. how you distinguish what you need to do and what we recommend. And what we ended that conversation with was the message that if you come back for this week, we want to talk about five strategies that you should know if you actually end up needing to go to an emergency room for getting successfully through the emergency room triage, Mm -hmm. the treatment protocols, and an exit out. So Mm -hmm. as a, as a, an ordinary person, not a medical specialist. Although we've had we've had stories in the last couple of months from doctors and nurses who've gone to the ER uh, as patients, <laughs> and you've been and had, somewhat horrified. <laughs> yeah, uh, a little learning is a dangerous thing, and, <laughs> and we've discovered that. Mm-hmm. But anyway, we want to talk to you this week about five strategies that we would recommend for conceptualizing your visit to an ER for yourself or someone that you love, and what you need to know before you get there about how to navigate the system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the first thing you need to decide is, do you have an acute problem? Something that has happened in the last three days, pretty much. I mean, three days, one day, three days. Acute means emergent, active, big. And new. If somebody says you have an acute angina, you don't smile and say, well, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's acute chest pain. So acute means... It has just, it's just happened. It's severe. It's a, it, it, it it's has, big. It, it's big. Yeah. So. It's scary. You're scared. And it's recent. It's not something that just, you've just been going through for months and you just decide that you want treatment. You're finally tired of yeah. going through it. And you don't want to wait for a doctor visit all of a sudden. That's not acute. So the last three days is a good rule of thumb. Yeah. If this is a condition that you've been struggling with for three days or less and you're afraid, you're in pain, your, your body is, is spasming all over the You're place in, in ways that it doesn't normally. <laughs> You've had a trauma. Go to the emergency yeah. room and go to a, a real emergency room as opposed to an urgent care. I mean, it, because, again, as we explained in our last podcast, there are uh, step-up facilities that you should be aware of and use for certain things. It's like they each have a required number of specialists on call. Right. And, and each level has a different requirement for specialty doctors and like neurosurgeons, Tests. heart surgeons, and for MRIs and CT scans. And now I found out that urgent care mm-hmm. has CT scans. Who knew? So you can go there, and if they find something, they can send you to someplace right. else. But if you really think that this is severe and new, or say you had headaches that were bad, worse, like over the last six months, and then this is the worst headache you've ever had, and it's severe, you need to go to the ER where they, the highest level ER that you have. So it could be something that's recurrent getting worse. It also could be if you have a chronic, like say you had diabetes, you have diabetes and it is brittle, meaning you can't keep your blood sugar Mm -hmm. um, healthy. That's a chronic condition, but you have an a, an acute problem, meaning you go into an insulin coma. Coma, yeah, you pass out. So then you need to go to the ER. That's very important. And yeah, or you stand up out of your easy chair and you pass out because your blood pressure fluxes, or uh, and you and that doesn't normally happen mm-hmm. to you. And you know, it's like, oh yeah, I fall three times a day. And then, yeah, this is a new thing. This is a new thing. It's always about new. So so that's a good cue that you need to go to the emergency room. Right. So, or something doesn't get better, like all of a sudden you can't speak. You may have had a stroke. Well, and some people think, I'm not that bad. I'm not bleeding. It's I just as been bad shot not to go as it is to go for little stuff. Right. And I used to tell my patients in, la- in labor, I'd rather see you five times in false labor than not see you the time the you were time in labor. labor. Yeah, so exactly. 
you know, but for that, you can go to the doctor's office and get checked. Mm -hmm. However, that's the same theory. I'd rather have somebody come in three times thinking they had a stroke than miss the one stroke Mm -hmm. because you can do some immediate action to help that so you don't have a deficit. You don't have a long-lasting lack of being able to walk or talk or think or have emotions or something like that. depends on where it is. So it's important to not underestimate your symptoms as well. This is, this is a hard lesson. I mean, honestly, it, it is a tough lesson. And that's really what primary care doctors are for, for them to say, oh, you need to go right to the emergency room. Something happened to me this weekend. I'm, I'm officially certified as unable to use any kind of handyman tools. <laughs> but I made a mistake and picked one up and cut myself. Somewhere. That was your first mistake. Well, it was. It was, indeed. But I was bleeding quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And my wife and I were struggling to get the bleeding stopped. Mm-hmm. And she's like, I think you need stitches. I think you need stitches. Uh, I was told some years back that your regular physician can't do that in their office anymore because of insurance regulations, because of blood concerns and contamination and AIDS and all those kind of things. So Some it, doctors do. Some do. Some do. So some primary a care, rule, it's a personal family judgment. doctors yeah. do, that kind of thing. But obviously, if it's after hours, right, you can't go to their office. That was a Sunday afternoon. Yeah, it's Sunday afternoon. So you have to go. I that. thought about calling you. Yeah. Well, um, my my house is always open for our friends <laughs> yeah. to. We have everything you need to stitch up somebody because that happens. You know, friends, neighbors, whoever needs to be stitched up comes over. You we might, do it. There's a science. It's the mop and dump style emergency <laughs> no, clinic. Come it's on no charge. It's no charge. Family and friends, and and we um, and we stitch people up. Right. So, but you have to know how deep yeah. a cut. Is and if it won't stop bleeding, my husband went to the office and held his hand above his head after he, he has the same issue. Yeah. Oh, did he no. handle some tools? Yes, he handled some tools. <laughs> so he wraps his hand up. He had a deposition or something. He's like this. Blood's dripping down here. I mean, he has the same problem. I wasn't told about this, and all of a sudden, you know, the he has nurses in his office. They do defense for medical malpractice, right, right. and 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 they go. You gotta come get him. He's bleeding all over the office. I mean, it was ridiculous. I've not heard that story. I know you haven't. It was embarrassing. So now I'm telling the world. Yeah. So he goes. He goes to Saint to Mercy, the, the level one trauma, which is right. where I train, and um, and he and I hear he calls me at the office and he says, "Hey, have I had a tetanus shot lately?" And I hear the ER in the background, and I go. He and Where I are, are so you? much alike. I don't know what. I know that's really scary. That's I think that's why we work well together. Yeah. But I, I, just, I said, "Are you in the ER?" And he goes, "Well, yeah." Well, sort of. <laughs> They're thinking about letting me in. <laughs> no, but he was in a room. They stitched him up. Yeah. And he needed stitches, mm-hmm. and it was it was a terrible gash, and so so if the bleeding doesn't stop, well, all I'm trying to say is if the bleeding doesn't stop, you got to go to the ER. Yes. If you wherever you get cut, hit, you know that kind of thing. But if there's if there's blood coming out of any orifice that won't stop, you've got to go to the ER because that could be your intestines, internal bleeding. People who run marathons right. get blood gut where they're pooping out blood mm. because they're. Their intestines get hypoxic because they've been running so far. Oh, wow. No kidding. That has to go to the ER. <laughs> I mean, any blood from any orifice that you can't stop, even if it's your u- uterus, uterine bleeding that just is severe and won't stop, mm-hmm. ER. So blood, blood's another condition that makes it a lot easier. Mm-hmm. to and, and trauma, head injuries, auto accidents. I mean, you fall, hit your head. I mean, we've had a uh, friend do that. Fall, hit his head at a restaurant. Wouldn't go. I mean, I don't know how to talk somebody into going to the ER. Usually I'm talking them into just coming to my house and letting me look at them. But, you know, that's a a huge issue. So you need to decide whether it's life-threatening. We've given you some keys Mm -hmm. on how to decide that. And if it's not, then if you go to a lower-level center, like urgent care or uh, a small emergency room, then if you don't get what you need. In other words, you don't get, this could happen in any emergency room. You aren't better. You haven't been told why. uh, And you don't know what to do next. Mm -hmm. Then you have to find out. You have to ask. Right. What, this is kind of like, you have to, you have to say, I need to go to a different center 
Will you send me to a different center so your insurance will pay for it? Can I get a higher level of care? Segue, but important segue. You you can't go to the emergency room, get frustrated because it's so slow or so busy or whatever they're not getting to you after you've checked in and leave on your own recognizance right? and then come back later because the insurance won't pick it up a second time for the same thing. That's right. uh, and if you want to go to another place down the road, you need to have them dismiss you yeah. so that you can check in down the road or else you're going to end up paying a lot of money. It's called leaving AMA against medical advice. So if you walk out, then you're going to end up with a big bill somewhere else if you need help for that same yeah. problem. Right. So be patient, calm down, and just state how you're feeling to the nurse nicely. Well, like, I feel like I've been lost, like somebody's left me in here for hours and I need to have some answers or go home or or be admitted. And that's a challenge. Like it, it, if you take your, your son or daughter or wife to the, to the emergency room and you feel like they're not getting any acknowledgement or treatment and you want to say, we've been here for a couple of hours. My wife is really uncomfortable. Is there a room you can put her in? Can she lay down? She's in pain. She's having trouble breathing. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that you say, but you have to say it in a uh, an appropriate way and not in an aggressive and hostile way or else they'll call security and have you removed and you're not going to be able to help the person that you love. That's true. That's true. There's There are also holidays come into play here. Mm -hmm. If you have an injury on a holiday, the ERs are full of everything. Yeah. They're full of absolutely everything because on one of our ice days on a New Year's Eve, Oh, falls and falls breaks. And, yeah, and, and usually the best time to go to the ER, write this down, is Sunday afternoon. <laughs> if you can wait till Sunday afternoon, it's usually cleared out from Forgetting Saturday night. Immediately, yeah. Right, Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon. But on New Year's Eve, many years ago, our, our daughter had a sledding accident, dislocated her hip. We didn't know what she did, whether she broke it or dislocated mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we go in and we're waiting for hours. Mm -hmm. And she passed out in my arms. There was no room. I mean, there were, everybody was so busy. These rooms were full. Mm -hmm. So I handed her to my husband and I went, because it's my, it was at my hospital and I asked for any orthopedic surgeon on call. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine came over, picked her up, took her to x-ray, x-rayed her, gave her some Valium and popped it out. Wow. So not everybody's got that trump card. Well, and, and again, there's a distinction. Hers was a dislocated hip. You can have a broken bone that doesn't puncture the skin. Yes. And it's not going to be as critical or in immediate need as a break that punctures the skin. Yeah. If you have right. bone sticking out of your skin somewhere, they want to get to you right away. Yeah. They'll put you at the top of the list. But if you've dislocated something, right. they don't really, you know, they don't think that that's really an emergency because it's not going to leave you with lasting damage unless it's left longer than, I think it's six hours. Don't take take that to the bank, but I think it's six hours. So they know they've got some time with you, but if the pain's so severe that your child right. passes out, my other option was to carry her up to the desk and say, she just passed out, right. and then yeah. get her in well, that way. What do way. we do now? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then that would triage us to the top or should have. Right. But I just don't think they had any rooms. You have to be cognizant of the fact that there are some days when volume for an ER mm -hmm. is so high that that you may not get in even if you're on the verge of dying or have something wrong well, with you. Well, and like if you have a breathing condition, mm -hmm. you know, they, they need to do x-rays and they mm -hmm. may need equipment for a breathing treatment. Right. And you may be in line with several people who have the same condition. Mm -hmm. You know, they have three breathing machines that they do treatment with mm -hmm. rotating among the, the area and you have to wait your turn. Mm -hmm. That's and, true. And it's hard to wait because you're scared. That's true. And but breathing, so so if you think about it, if you think that you have something that requires specific equipment, right. like you've had something like this before, like if you've had I mean, like we talked about head injuries. Yeah. So you're gonna need an MRI or a CT scan, maybe with contrast, and that usually is done at the higher level hospitals right. than go to the higher level hospital. If you think you've just had a bump on the head, you didn't lose consciousness, but you need to be stitched, urgent care, right. okay? So if you need specific, like if you have, like we were talking about, if you have a knife <laughs> stuck in here, I mean, if you've had trauma, if you've had a gunshot wound, that goes to the level one trauma. And 
you need specific, you need surgeons, you need an operating room open, you need all those anesthesia, that goes to the top of the list. So there's some things you know you're going to need some big equipment. Right. You need to go to the, be- the highest level ER you've got. And then an additional one is for those of us, particularly of the masculine persuasion, who are getting older mm-hmm. and we resist going. Somebody like my wife says, you need to go to the emergency room with that. And I'm like, oh, I'll be okay. You know, don't be silly. Yeah, you guys are really but, silly. Well, yeah. Like, well, like your husband going because he had a deposition with his arm strapped to his ear and blood <laughs> dripping down his shoulder. You know, men are not all that bright at times, and so you have. It's hard to force you guys because you're big. You have and people so it's hard that to take make care you of you. <laughs> and when they say, "Get in the car, we're going to the emergency room." Get in the car, go to the emergency room. That's number four. <laughs> Listen to your spouse or your child or somebody who knows what they're talking about, who loves you, mm-hmm. who cares about you, friends, who have your best interests in mind, when they say you need to go to the ER and they're going to drive you or they're going to take you or they're going to find somebody to take you or call the ambulance, do it. We, uh, Don't give anybody any trouble. It, it is not your call because you're not in your right mind when you're sick. We moved my wife's grandmother when she was elderly and ill in with us. We told mm-hmm. her she could die at our house, which she eventually did. But she had a couple of strokes, and she resisted going to the hospital when she mm-hmm. had these events. And my wife was knowledgeable enough to know what she was looking at and would insist. And one time we even called the ambulance. And the only thing that she could say, waiting on the ambulance to come, is what will the neighbors think? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't care what the, the neighbors, neighbors think. think yeah. You're going to the emergency room. Yeah. You know? And, yeah, and that's- so sometimes older people, you if you are a caretaker, you have to insist because... They'll resist. Yeah. There's another thing that you need to know. If you know that your parents or grandparents are on hospice. Yeah. Yes. Once you've you've signed up for hospice, that means that you're, you not acknowledge and everyone else acknowledges that you're dying. Okay. You're just going to get palliative care so that you're not in pain. Right. You're going to get pain medicine or you're going to get other things that'll help you ease your way into the next life. Mm -hmm. So you can't go to the ER. You have signed your right away with Medicare. And if you do go to the ER, see, that's why they'll pay for your palliative care for for, um, hospice is because you've traded all those ER visits for care from a nurse who's coming in to evaluate and take care of you and, and medicate you. So you have to know that about your parent or grandparent. So ask questions and if you can't and if there's a bunch of siblings you have a bunch of siblings write it down put it in an email i mean i love this we've got email you can just send it to everybody and say these are the rules for my parent for our parents those emergency care directives advanced care directives for medical decision making you need to have them you need to have them signed you need to have them on your smartphone Mm-hmm. Phyllis had them for her grandmother because she you can take was a picture of your of, of, of your and own every time we care the hospital, directive. She had to generate copies again mm-hmm. to the same hospital. Mm-hmm. We were here a month ago. You have all that in your file. We need it now. So, I, I just don't get that part because either, they're all EMRs. They should just be able to look it up. Easier to have it and show it to them than it was to fight with them. But anybody who's going to be taking care of you or your loved one has to have all this data and a list of meds. If you have a smartphone, there are apps where you can list everything that you've ever taken or been assigned, the dosage, the doctor, all your allergies, all of that. So you just hand them your smartphone. It's right there. Yeah, Which is awesome because I mean, that is, that's part of technology. If you keep it updated, (laughs) things amazed, amazing. And you have to have it easy for them to find. Yeah. You know, so like there's a thing called my medications. They can just hit that. So that's important. So you have to listen to those who love you. You have to provide the information Mm -hmm. to everyone who's taking care of that person because it's not really fair for you to have the information. Then your sister comes in and takes care of mom, and then mom has to go to the ER, and there's no nothing. Nobody has the documentation. Right. So go ahead. So finally, you get to the emergency room. You get seen. You get through the triage. They take care of you. What have they done? And they're getting ready to send you home. Or send they you say away something somewhere. like, "You're fine." We had, we had a um, situation like this where our um, relative was not thinking straight mm-hmm. because of something that had happened to her, and the ER says, "You're done. See ya." Six month follow up with a neurologist. I mean, 
she still had the symptoms she came in with. She still couldn't figure out what was going on. She was still kind of delirious. Didn't Her memory was bad. Mm-hmm. They had found something, but they did tell us the diagnosis. But that's it. Mm-hmm. So what happens next? Mm-hmm. So what happens next is she goes home and she gets, she's still the same way or worse. Nothing, nothing's different when the pain medicine wears off. So you have to go to a different, better, higher level. So you have, you have some time to look it up. If ER. You survive if you have If the you option. survive that. Yeah. Because that can be dangerous. So, so you have to know the diagnosis. So there are questions you should ask before you leave. Right. They're getting ready to check you out. You want to ask and, and have it written down. I have somebody take note of if you're not in a capacity to take note mm-hmm. of what is my diagnosis? What did you find specifically? Because all, all of the medical conditions, there's a book called the ICD-10 uh, 10 10 now. <laughs> now that lists all the diagnostic codes that, that insurance companies, hospitals, and doctors use to tell each other, oh, that's what this is. Just like a little number so, short shorthand. So what is my diagnosis? What treatment have you given me for my problem today? What did we do? Well, we gave you an MRI. We gave you a CT scan. We took your blood pressure. We checked your blood enzymes. We, we checked for these conditions. That's what we did. And then you want to know the results, too. And how do you get copies of your x-rays? You have to know right. where you're going to send somebody to come back and get copies of your x-rays because it's never right there. They can't just give it to you. Mm-hmm. So you have to come back for a CD or, or a DVD to get your extra x-rays to take to whoever you're going to see afterwards. Well, that's where we have an advantage with our doctor. Our doctor and hospitals are all in the same computer system. Mm-hmm. So when I go to my physician's office, she puts the data in. Mm-hmm. If I show up in the same corporate emergency room, mm-hmm. they just pull my name up and all my all stuff right. is there. Right, but if you so, have to go to a if you have to go somewhere else, or, or, yeah. or to a doctor's office that's not on staff, and it's right. hard to find that. Yeah. So you have to know what's going to happen if I go home, and your treatment doesn't work, or if I get sicker. Right. You ask them, "What do I do next? What do, do I, I do come next? back here? Or do I go somewhere else? Right. You know, do so, you arrange for me to check in? Right. So am I going to have to go back through this whole process? Am I, you know, so so you want to know that. This is going to be on our blog as well, so you don't have to write this down if you're running or something. So what doctor should I see? They'll say, oh, you need to see a neurologist within six months. Which one? When? How do I get in touch with them? Right. Who are you referring me to? That's essential. Mm -hmm. And like with um, when your wife was in the ER, Mm -hmm. they they didn't give her a time frame. They just said, you need to see this orthopedic surgeon. And she had a time-sensitive problem your urgent care decision she woke up one morning in extreme pain and couldn't move her arm couldn't move it at all so we went to the emergency room they did the test they they came back and said we're going to give you all these muscle relaxants we think that'll take care of it uh, but you need to see a neurologist within the next six months they said an orthopedic surgeon. orthopedic surgeon i'm sorry you're right and it was something with her neck yeah but she wasn't exactly sure what it was right. with her neck right so six months she couldn't move her arm she couldn't lift it she couldn't move it. That's that's. This is another tip. If you can't move a limb, like all of a sudden you can't move one of your limbs, you've got a neurosurgery problem. You need a back doctor. Now there are some orthopedic surgeons that do backs, but not mm-hmm. very many. But you need a neurosurgeon because you need somebody to take that disc out and put something else in. And there's a time Which is limit. What happened with her? Yeah. There's a time limit. So when um, by chance I called. Or Brett called me because we were gonna, he was going to be late. He's in the ER. I said, Ah, no, you you have. I mean, I know that from my emergency room training. Any limb that doesn't move for a day or two is right. is going to lose ability to move. Right. So you could have lasting damage. So she needed to see a neurosurgeon. He operated on her within a week. Within a week, yeah. So that was Not and that six was. Months. That was saved her ability to use her arm. Yes, it did. So that that was huge, and that had nothing to do with their advice from the ER. No. If they'd followed the ER advice, you'd follow the. Be... She would not have her arm use use of her right. arm. Right. You should ask them, when should I feel better? What's what's the anticipated? After four days of pain meds. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. When should I feel better? Like should I feel better when the antibiotics are over? Should I feel better before that? That kind of thing. Or. When should I feel better? Well, you won't until you see your other doctor, you know, right. that kind of thing. So they should be able to tell you that. Mm-hmm. And, and then you should ask them, are there any activities that I should not do? 
for instance, a, a number of men who have had what they think are strokes or heart attacks will want to ask, should I have sex? Mm -hmm. Should I avoid having sex until mm -hmm. after we figure out what this is? Mm -hmm. Because will that kill me? Right. And sometimes, And the doctor will say, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but but did you want to ask? Right, and you should probably you know, avoid it. Maybe if I, I don't shouldn't know if it's operate heavy you. machinery. I shouldn't, yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't operate home hand tools, uh, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. There's certain medications. If you're on them, you should not be doing anything dangerous. Drive. Shouldn't. Sometimes you shouldn't drive. Right. Sometimes you know, going to work. If you're a decision maker and other people's lives depend on it, you probably shouldn't do that either. And then finally, ask the question: Would I be better if I stayed here? If I got a room and stayed in the hospital overnight or for a day or two? And you may need to tell them, I have no one at home to take care of me. If I go home and I get worse, I'm going to be in a critical situation. I'm not. I'm still in a lot of pain. You know, can we discuss my options for staying here? Basically, if you know, oftentimes because ER doctors are brilliant and they move fast and they're 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 really talented people, but they're bogged down with all this other stuff that comes in, mm -hmm. stuff that's not emergency, and it, so it kind of messes with their their rhythm and their, you know, they're fast moving. And so it's frustrating for them. So sometimes they will say, you know, it's kind of like, just get out of my emergency room. Right. The flotsam and jetsam yeah. float to the emergency so room. So sometimes that's not appropriate for you. Sometimes you, and not because you don't have somebody at home, but you need more tests. Tests that can only be done in the hospital right. and will be done quickly in the hospital. Whereas if you're outpatient, you're going to go here one week and there another, and you won't have all your information. If this is a time sensitive thing, which many things are, which you need to know. Emergent care should be. Yeah, you need yeah. to know basically how to how to go about this. And and if you can't do it outside quickly, mm -hmm. and most things you can't then you should just stay in the hospital for observation, which is less than 24 hours, or be admitted and get a series of tests that and a, and a doctor to come see you, which is very important, a doctor with the specialty needed. Okay. So hopefully this conversation will get you to start thinking about in anticipation. If I should ever have an emergency, it's kind of like having a fire escape practice with your <laughs> children at home. Uh, because when the emergency happens, you need to have a plan. You need to know what to do. So if nothing else, we hope that our conversation today stimulates that discussion in your home and in your life. As always, thank you for thank listening. You. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.